Hello, and I'm Megan Bond. And I'm Evie Jessup, who some of you might recognise from Blow the Whistle. However, today I'm helping out on women in politics. politics. Coming up on today's show, which has been put together entirely by women. Oh, wait. Oh. We hear from the Glasgow councillor behind the UK's first feminine city about what needs to be done to get more women into politics. More women being elected, um, more women being able to access childcare and therefore able to enter the labour market, having more women um, being confident enough. Sky News political correspondent explains how much things have changed for women reporting on politics over the years. A lot of women fought some really tough battles to, you know, cover politics and face a lot of sexism and, and you know, they've been there a long time, whereas now we're seeing women starting out and I, I really think that it's great they're often having quite a different experience than I did. We'll find out just how many women are involved in decision making in the Parliament at the moment. And we paid a visit to the birthplace of the suffragettes where women started to fight against their oppressions. I remember being in a different part of the country and learning about that as a kid, but not really as it as part as part of women's history, just as part of general history. I really think it's quite important. Politics has previously been thought to be male dominated but now balanced as the profession is now including women. Well, statistics from the Institute for Government show that as of March 2022, there were 225 female MPs in the House of Commons. This was five more than the total that were elected in Parliament in the 2019 general election. One of the largest jumps of the amount of female P MPs elected in an election was in 2015, where it, was, it, where it rose from 22 to 30%. Comparing to the rest of the world, where the UK has the 38th highest proportion of women in the Parliament, earlier this month, Jacinda Ardern left her job as New Zealand's Prime Minister. She was praised mostly for her response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw New Zealand face some of the toughest restrictions across the world. However, she is also being regarded as a feminist icon because of her answers to interview questions that have been called out for being sexist. In 2019, she was considered 38th most powerful woman in the world. She was the third female Prime Minister of New Zealand and the first to be pregnant in office. The reason for her resigning has been praised as she said, I'm human, politicians are human, we give all that we can for as long as we can and then it's time and for me it's time. Now, after being elected a Scottish Green Party councillor for Langside, Holly Bruce has turned her attention to making Glasgow the UK's first feminist city, with the motion being passed at the end of last year. Abby Titness spoke to her about why the changes in policy is so important to her and why she has got involved into politics. It sounds so corny, but I just really like people. Like That is what gives me energy and life and value. and. Um, just chatting to people and trying to solve their problems and trying to like empower them and um, yeah that's been been really good and, and I, I live in the community that I represent so I know exactly the problems that everyone's facing and it's just nice to like be able to have that lived experience as well and help people on the road with with whatever issue it is that they have. Have you had any challenges sort of being a woman in the political sector? A lot of kind of online abuse as you'd, as you'd expect. Um, the, our, um, the councillors in Glasgow City are 33% women at the moment. And um, so we're still not equal in terms of numbers. Um, although the Green Group do have five women and five men. So um, we, we make a con conscious effort to be better there. Um, but in terms of this, the, the feminist city motion that you speak about, I um, had a few hurdles there with um, chief officers in in the city council that didn't understand my motion and um, was querying its competency, which, as you can imagine, as a young woman, filled me with imposter syndrome, made me feel like this was a bad idea, when in fact. It, was, it wasn't, it, it's a very good idea and a lot of people support it and there's a lot of research behind it and it was just that kind of, um, because it was two older white men 
tell me that it, it was wrong. It, it just filled me with this um, doubt. And it happens every day. And I, I can't, it, but I have to obviously put in kind of boundaries to make sure that I don't make myself ill with it. But um, it does give me comfort that I feel like I'm inspiring people. And I honestly don't think I could do anything else now that I've done this job. And what sort of, what's been a reaction to the, your feminist movement? As you'd expect, people are like, feminist? Why feminist? Like, it, I don't understand what people's issue is with the word feminist or feminism. It is essentially equality um, and it is to stop oppression of women. Like, so, yeah, there was some pushback about why is it feminist, but there's been research done that shows that applying a gendered lens gendered to planning lens. will benefit everyone. And that that is essentially what feminist time planning is. Is the reason you've put this into motion now because sort of you're in a position to do so? Or do you think making cities more feminist and sort of female minded is sort of become quite critical at this sort of point in society? Both. Um, to be to be um, clear on that, I think it was an opportunity that I had. I was recently elected, May last year. Um, I knew that the administration, who's the SNP at the moment, were keen on the idea and I just needed their backing to, in order to get the motion passed. So I knew that if the motion was strong enough and good enough, that it, it would be passed. Um, and also the work I did with a feminist organization prior to being elected in um, the Young Women's Movement, um, we did a lot of research into specifically parks and buses and how women interact with them in the city. So I already had the knowledge and the data that was um, really recent um, and local to Glasgow. So I was like, I've got this data, the political will's there, now's the time. Um, but I do think you're right in what you're saying is, um, Sadly, and as we've seen this past week, the amount of news coverage that there is now of about violence against women and um, safety concerns that women have of, it's becoming more and more reported on and, and apparent that it's unavoidable at this stage. And it and it shouldn't have been avoidable in the first place, but it is, it is very much in the spotlight, um, quite, quite rightly so, and, um, it, it, it can't be ignored politically anymore and it's it's important for 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 women's safety do you think there's enough women involved in those decisions about women no, no. what could be done to get more women sort of with those many many things starting off with more women in politics more women being elected um, more women being able to access childcare and therefore able to enter the labour market, having more women um, being confident enough to do it. Um, that's a huge thing. I, I um, would consider myself a confident person, but it took me a while to believe in myself enough to be like, actually, you would be good at this role. Um, and we also need women who are from a, a, a diverse range of backgrounds and jobs and um, have different experiences. Women have been involved in making political change in many different ways which inspire others to get involved. One of these is the first female cabinet minister, Margaret Bonfield. She was a labour politician, trade unionist and a women's rights activist. And the current vice president, Kalama Harris, is the first female to hold the position and is the first African-American and Asian-American vice president. Looking back into history, an iconic political protester is Emily Davison, who was known for running onto the racetrack at the 1913 Derby and was killed by King George V horse. Staying on the topic of suffragettes, Jessica Blackburn uh, joins us in the studio to tell us a bit more about their struggles to gain the right to yeah. Vote, and as you yeah. can see, I'm even wearing my Votes for Women pin badge <laughs> to really show my support for the movement. Uh, but I've got some key dates that I'm just going to take you through quickly. Uh, so in 1866, that was when the suffragette movement, movement really started. It started with the suffragists, who were more 
Uh, they were calmer and not as violent. They didn't break windows. They petitioned. Most of them were friends with MPs, so they got in touch with them and did things like that. Uh, in 1903, the Women's Social and P Political Union was formed by Emmeline Pankhurst, who was actually from Manchester, and it was in her house in Manchester that the movement started. Uh, she moved into a house. It was next to a dance school, and it's thought that her daughters went to the dance school, and that's how she was able to get the building and use it. In 1907, they stormed the Houses of Parliament for the first time, and 76 of them were arrested, which really gives you an, an idea of the sense of just how many women were involved in this. Uh, in 1910, they tried to pass a, a conciliation bill, which failed in Parliament. It was rejected. In 1912, they tried to do it again. It failed again. Uh, in 1913, the government started the Cat and Mouse Act, which was this really horrendous act. Um, they would arrest suffragettes. The suffragettes were were on hunger strike and because they didn't want to, the suffragettes to die they would force feed them through a tube through their throats and they would release them they would be released really weak and then they'd keep coming back and back again and again and repeating it which is really awful um, but then in 1914 obviously it was World War One, and uh, all of it stopped the men went off to war and the women had to fill the roles that men did so they worked in factories they worked on farms they did all all of the roles that the men would do and in 1918 because of the the things that women had done during the war, they passed the uh, Representation of the People Act, which allowed everyone over the age mm -hmm. of 30 to vote, including women. Um, however, in 1928, they lowered that age to 21, which meant that everyone was able to vote. So Emmeline Pankhurst was actually from Manchester, as I mentioned before, and her house is in the city centre. It's been turned into a women's suffrage museum, and I went there to find out more about the suffrage movement. The Pankhurst Museum is the birthplace of the suffrage movement. It was here in 1903 that Emmeline Pankhurst, mother of the movement, along with her children, started campaigning for women's voting rights. The bit that we're sat in at the moment is part of the second building. It's part of a row of uh, Victorian villas. And they lived here uh, between 1898 and 1907. Then they moved down to London because they decided that they needed to be where Parliament was to put more pressure on Parliament. Why did they move down to London? Obviously to like put pressure on Parliament, but is there any other reason as well? It was a much bigger movement down there, so there were a lot more groups set up around there as well, and they just felt that they could uh, campaign much closer to Parliament. Also, they had friends who were really willing, the Pethick Lawrences, to help fund things, and that was also the other thing they wanted to do. They set up a shop to... Uh, make sure that they could get some money in, but they were also able to lobby people who would give them money towards the cause. So basically, if they moved down there, they then rented out some offices that the Pethick Lawrence has paid for. They were able to do some printing, make their own booklets. So it was a much better place for them to be in the point of view of getting the ear of people in Parliament. The suffrage movement was made up of two different groups. The suffragettes, who used civil disobedience to campaign, and the suffragists, who used more peaceful methods. I think the, the suffragettes were small. They started off quite large and I think that some of the group reduced because they were like I don't like the militant style that you're doing things and that included some of the Pankhurst family so Sylvia she said in the end actually this is not for me I feel it's not just about a women's vote it's about everyone being equal and she went off in a different direction and I think it was the militancy that put people off in the end and there's a lot of arguments as to whether actually that militancy helped or hindered the cause of the suffragists so some people believe it did help because it got it into the press and some people believe that it wasn't helpful. However, at the outbreak of World War I, the suffrage campaign stopped as women across the country filled the roles left behind by the men who had been conscripted. And they said, you know, that's, you know, we'll, we will support the government, we won't do that. But of course, a lot of the women took over the roles that the men had to because everyone was sent out to war. And actually, after that, the government didn't feel that they could turn around and say, no, we're not going to give you the vote because they kept the country running. But they were worried that women would have the majority vote. So what they did was put a cut on it and said that you have to be over 30 and property owning or married to a property owning person. Um, because otherwise that would have swung the, the votes for the next election, which happened a few years later, in the favour of women. And a lot of people at the time said, yes, we understand this is what we're doing, but this is step one. And then it was another 10 years, 1928 where all women over 21 got the vote. But what about now? Does the work of the suffragettes still apply today? I think they still inspire people now because what it's done, particularly we find with younger people when they come to visit the schools, that um, they're really interested in, in why they wanted to campaign in such militant ways. And they see a parallel now between what's going on with things like Just Stop Oil and with other protesters, environmental protesters. and. I think it inspires them to think about actually if this group of people who started off in a small house can make such a big noise, then maybe we can. What I'm noticing, particularly here, because I think it's Manchester-based, 
because uh, they look at famous local people, often people are looking at Emily and Pankhurst. And I remember being in a different part of the country and learning about that as a kid, but not really as it as part, as part of women's history, just as part of general history. I really think it's quite important, actually. I think that women should have a chance to find out, you know, how recently we got the vote, but how much worse it is in other countries. I worked with some students from Switzerland, they only got the vote in the 1970s, which is a shocker. But I think young people, and particularly young men, need to understand this as well, that a lot of them think now it's all very equal. It really still isn't, but it was so much worse before. And I think it's really important to make sure all people know that, you know, change happens, but you take steps. But actually we're a little bit better off than we were, but there's still more to come. Stories featured on news programmes and the causes that are pushed into the government spotlights are often dependent on who is raising awareness of them. We spoke to Sky's political correspondent, Tamar Cohen about the challenges women are facing in government and what it's like to report on them. So I joined um, the lobby, I became a political journalist in 2012, so just over 10 years ago. and. Yes, there were some high profile women um, political journalists, but not not many of them. I mean, in general, the whole. So the lobby is a funny place. There's corridors in Parliament with rooms for different media organisations. Um, so it's a bit of a kind of um, university campus vibe, if you like. Um, and I'd say most of the, the, the newspaper teams had one woman out of, you know, five or six people. And um, the newspaper I worked on had two. And um, but it was but it was bigger um so jet in general the the sort of atmosphere was quite was quite laddish in a way and um i think that also affected the sort of um the, and and certainly that was also the case in political parties as well although some did better than others the number of women mps um you know particularly in the conservative party was pretty low when i started it's improved quite a lot since and I think you did notice that in the sort of stories that newspapers wrote and the sort of issues that MPs focused on and, and just in the culture. And um, I think that's changed a lot now. I'm seeing a lot more women coming through. We've now got, you know, fantastic women political editors like Laura Coonsberg and Beth Rigby, you know, people who you can sort of aspire to. And I, I think the change has been has been quite dramatic. And it's also since we've had a lot of new outlets, new websites and so on. I think you also see younger women as well because, um, you know, a lot of women fought some really tough battles to, you know, cover politics and face a lot of sexism and, and you know, they'd been there a long time, whereas now we're seeing women starting out and I, I really think that it's great that they're often having quite a different experience than I did. Everyone was very welcoming to me, and I was always felt very supported by uh, the people who I who I worked for. Of course, you do sometimes um, sort of get a bit of um, sexism from you know um, you know in Parliament. That does happen. I wouldn't say it was any particular party or any particular circumstances, but um, I think certainly as a young woman, I did occasionally um, feel that way that I was being a bit patronised. Um, but um, and I and I don't know if that still happens. I think things is, things have moved on quite a lot um, since then, especially since we've got a lot younger MPs as well. Certainly this time, I'm often talking to MPs who are about ten years younger than me. Um, so I think things have moved moved on a lot, and that's that's a very positive step. <laughs> important I mean issues like violence against women and girls just weren't really on the political radar you know quite a few years ago I think Theresa May did um, quite a big job as Prime Minister in, in putting those issues on on the agenda I think you've seen issues like childcare shoot up the agenda and that's not just to do with there being more women MPs actually it's to do with I think male MPs taking more of an in, you know being more involved in that kind of thing so I think it definitely affects um, not only the sort of legislation um, that goes to Parliament, but the sort of debates that you end up having about it. You know, people are are leading different lifestyles, and and that's sort of reflected in 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 the you know the debates and in the outcomes we have. That's all for today. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. G goodbye.